welcome you to the Nathaniel Orr home. The structure was built and it was a wagon shop at that point and then it was turned into a home in 1868 when he married Emma in Victoria. So I'll be telling you a little bit more about the family, the history a little bit later, but the house was purchased by the Stillicum Historical Museum Association in 1974 from the second generation Glenn Orr, who was the last member and died in 93. We're standing in the hallway and above me is a, what used to be a whale oil lantern that they hung in the wagon shop. When the house was electrified in 1914, Nathaniel Orr brought it into the home for this hallway. We're looking down the hallway and you will see this gorgeous green and gold wallpaper. This wallpaper when we purchased the house in 1974 was the original wallpaper and it was faded to a beige. We had no idea that the real wallpaper was this particular color that you see now until I found a sample of it in a trunk upstairs. And with that, much later, we were able to have it restored by Stal Mandry, who was a very influential wallpaper dealer in New York and North Carolina. I want to point out to you, because when we had this wallpaper restored, um, part of the funding came from the Questers International, which was a 5,000 grant that we received, and we are certainly very appreciative of that. I'd like to welcome you into the parlor. Probably the most historic, significant artifact that we have is the family Bible that sits on this table. It has the births, the marriages, and the deaths of the family of the Orrs. Nathaniel married Emma Thompson in Victoria in 1868, and we have this recorded, of course, in the family Bible. Emma and Nathaniel were to have eight children during their marriage. The first one in 1870, the last one in 1890. The deaths unfortunately show many names. By the time that Emma died in 1908, five of her children had died, preceded her. The most tragic one probably was when their oldest daughter, Emma, at 21 died and within the next week, the youngest son, John, died at one year old. So that this shows the tragedy of this particular family and I will be giving you some more genealogy as we continue on. Most of the furniture that we have in the house is comes from the Orr family, 90% of it actually. So we are very fortunate and as some people may know, if you've lived in a house for a long, long time, you never throw anything away. And because of that, we are very fortunate to have what we have. The table in front of me with holding the family Bible, the sofa behind me with its accompanying chairs, the table, the whatnot shelf in the corner, and the rocking chair here are all from the purchase that Nathaniel did 
in Victoria in 1868, just before they were married. Probably the other most significant item in this parlor, besides the Bible, is this wonderful white stone pitcher. And the story is, there was a merchant whose name was Louisa Goodtime, and she would go up to Victoria to buy her goods for her store here in town. He met, she met Emma Thompson there, and she told her how wonderful Stillicum was. So one day, Emma came down by steamer with Louisa to Stillicum to visit. At that time, she went up the hill where the well was, um, in front, way up in front of the house, with the pitcher, and there she met Nathaniel. And so this has a very significant um, picture as far as the family was concerned. We have two items here that are not part of the original family furniture. The secretary or bookcase that you see here originally was made by Nathaniel for the soldiers up at Fort Stellicum. And when they left the fort after the Civil War, he purchased it back. And it was at that time, of course, the wagon shop was turned into a home. So we have this. We feel that this cutout of the shelf here was done when it was up at Fort Stoicum because, of course, the soldiers liked their grog. And we hear read about um, in the Puget Sound Herald about how they came to town and the editor called them the bulwarks of liberty. So it was left here. Um, this hole was left. And so we have to accommodate the bottle. The other item that is not um, to the home to begin with is this square grand piano, which came around the horn, came to the wharf by sailing ship, and then it was hauled up to the house by oxen, and here it sits today. Now the family was a very musical family, and so you can see some of the instruments besides the piano that are here, and because of that, I think they used the parlor a much more than usually people would have in those days because the rug, which you can see here, this beautiful floral rug, also was purchased in Victoria in 1868. The other thing that is significant to the family are these linen drapes at the window. They were grown from flax on the Orr homestead back in Abington, Virginia, and then they were brought here and hung, and I must say that I have washed these beauty, and they have come out beautifully, so it's obviously a, a very firm flax, and of course it's a narrow one because this would have been with the width of the, the loom. The wallpaper that was on the walls originally had been, oh, water spotted and so forth. So we were able to have this wallpaper also reproduced by Scalamandry. And it went up and it's kind of just a very subtle pattern. And then when the house fell, of course, it was destroyed. And so I called back to Scalamandry to find out if they still had the original um, rolls that they had um, used to make the paper. And fortunately they had, and it was very um, <laughs> cheaper, less expensive to do it the second time than it did the first time. So that was a real relief before we started looking at the wallpaper that we're gonna talk about up the stairs. In the parlor is this hanging lantern. It originally was a kerosene lantern, which had to be um, cleaned every day. And when we brought it to the house, it was not original to the house, we had it electrified. And there was a liner here, but we do not have any idea where it came from. And I add on the cable with the Bible is a picture of Emma Thompson at the age of 18, just before she was married to Nathaniel, and a picture of Nathaniel when he was around 21. And also we have some calling cards of the daughters that were here. One was Emma and one was um, some of their friends. So everyone would have calling cards that they would drop off when they would come to call. Here is another unique item. It, it is a folding footstool. And you put it like this, it collapses, and then you can 
So probably you could take this with you when you went on a carriage ride because people were very short in those days and they needed to have something to raise their feet with. Now we're in the bedroom, which is still on the lower floor, which was probably in those days wasn't called a master bedroom, but that's what it would be today. This bedroom set was also purchased in Victoria, and I might add the furniture in the, lit, the parlor and in the bedroom came to a total of $165. And of course, Victoria was in English with pounds, but of course, Nathaniel paid with dollars. Anyway, this um here, sleigh bed and the bureau and the nightstand were all part of that purchase. The only thing that did not belong in here originally is this 1890 carriage that was for children and there is one very similar to it in an 1890 Sears catalog. This we call the dining room and probably at one point it would be like they call family room because it is a large room and with all the children. So here we have a table set up with English designed china and then on the table next to it is children's games for the children. When we bought the house, we meaning the Stilton Historical Association, we saw a house that needed some restoration. We were fortunate enough to get a grant from matching grant from the state of Washington to do some restoration. So one of the objects or projects we had in this room was taking down four layers of wallpaper. So you can imagine how intensive that must have been because it also included taking off the wallpaper on the ceiling because they seem to like ceilings being wallpapered as well. Now when they took the wallpaper off you can see the vertical lines of the boards so this is what it was like, which meant we didn't have any insulation left either without all of that four layers of wallpaper. Um, we had a person come from um, the start, the state archaeological, and from that we were able to find, determine the color of the room, and it was a gold. And when I talked to Bertha Orr, back in Virginia after she had left and said we had painted the rooms and she said what did you do paint them white and I said no we painted them gold and what she said that's right because they were painted colonial gold and each room was a little bit different in the gold because he had to mix the paint no Benjamin Moore or whatever paint was is available now so that's why the rooms originally were all painted gold, but a different tone. And then, of course, the family wallpapered a lot of them afterwards so that that was um, traditional. In the room, we have a stove that was burned, used for burning coal and wood in silicon. That was pretty um, standard if you didn't have a fireplace place. Next to the stove is the table that has a domed vitron, which has waxed fruit. And then there is also an organ, which of course was not original to the family, but it was in the 1891 school when it was built up on the hill next to where the present school is now. And so this was brought in as a, a donation from one of the members. Here's the wedding picture of Nathaniel and Emma when they were married in Victoria on May 11th, 1868. She is wearing a black silk taffeta dress and you will see that a little bit later in our tour. So they brought, they came home to Stelecum by steamer and this is where they established their home and their family. But this is the wedding picture. We have a clock above the organ, which is 
probably made in Waterbury, Connecticut. But what makes it interesting is the picture on the front has been painted and it is a picture of General Pierce's home in New Hampshire. General Pierce would then become the president of the United States in 1853. So this is kind of an interesting picture and we do not know whether the family um, painted this or it was originally on the, the picture, but it is an interesting addition to the clock. We're not sure when this particular section of the structure was added. It may have been before the house was, the wagon shop was turned into a house or it could have been later. But we do have this stovepipe hole. And at one point there would have been a stove in the wagon shop to keep Nathaniel warm and the stovepipe would have come out to an exterior area. But the reason that we've left this like it is because it shows a single wall construction and you have the three pieces of wood that went vertically up to the ceiling. Now this room, of course, is the kitchen now, and it was, of course, when Emma came to, um, with, to have her family. Right. This stove was not the original in the house. However, we were able to find this stove that was originally probably here, and it is a majestic. And of course, she cooked many, many meals here. The kitchen, of course, besides the stove, is probably the table as the most important thing. So all of the tables in the house were made by Nathaniel. And, and the reason we know this is they had all very distinctive legs because of the special lathe that he used. So this is one of the tables. There are two in the dining room. There's one in the hallway. There's some upstairs. So we all know that they were made by Nathaniel as were these chairs. When we took over the house, there were two of these large tea boxes in the house. And from this, we assume that the Orr family were real tea drinkers and they're rather unique because I'm sure they came from San Francisco up by sailing ship into the harbor and were brought to the house. Or they could have been have come directly from the Asia to Stellicum. Nathaniel Orr was a master craftsman. And as I mentioned, the tables that he had crafted, and he also did this beautiful cabinet. It has been wood grained, as you can see, it's called full graining. And this is done with special equipment. And we happen to still have this in the house, telling how to do the update on graining. Um, in the Rothschild house in Port Townsend, there is also extensive graining going up the banister. So it's interesting, you will see it in different homes. We feel though that probably maybe one of the sons did this. We're not sure. And this was such a quality piece that in the early 80s, it was one of the um, selected pioneer furniture pieces that was put in the Museum of History and Industry for a special exhibit. So we feel very flattered with that. And then also he has a breadboard here that he has put very, you know, very inventive, inventive. I mentioned that we did a restoration in 1980. And at that time we decided that this particular section we would have as it would have been in 1914 when Alexa electricity came to Stellicum. So you will see lights hanging here. And then also, um, so that the earlier section is all goes back to 1880s and uh, this particular section, 1914 and on. When we did the restoration here in the kitchen was a particularly uh, challenging time because there was linoleum, which we got, went back to the 1920s here, that had to be all pulled up, which was a terrible task. And then on the ceiling, which you can see are these long vertical boards, it was covered with a felt paper. And this felt paper had been tacked up with nails that were probably about a quarter up 
to a half an inch wide. And so here were these people who were doing this work, having to look up and try to get all of these tacks off. So it was a tremendous job and it's wonderful to see this new wood, this old wood painted as it is today, which makes it a lot easier for cleaning too. And the floor, um, I mentioned with the linoleum, but when we took all the linoleum off, of course, you've got this wonderful fur, which was readily available in those days. One of the questions that visitors often ask is, what is that? And when you look at it, you might wonder, but it is a sausage press. So this was used in the family. Probably they had pigs and a cow and chickens. And so this was used for making the pop sausage. This is a foot warmer. And because the winters were colder, um, often they would take, a woman would take one of these with her when they went for a carriage ride and you put a piece of hot coal in here and then you insert it in the foot warmer, close it, and then you have a handle and you would be on your way on a cold winter night. It's a carpet sweeper of around 1898 and it, the basic design is still today except it's in plastic. <laughs> so, some things have been invented, others just stay the same in a different material. This is Emma's pantry, and evidently she spent a great deal of time here because the floor underneath the table is bowed. And then the story is that she spent so much time here that she asked Nathaniel to have a window put in so she could look outside. And the fruit that um, you can see in the pantry, Bertha, the daughter-in-law, had canned for years. And she did this over a wood stove. And it, of course, was not good anymore when we took over the home, so we had to throw it out. But we do have canned vegetables there to give an idea of what it would have been like in those days. This room has just been newly done for an exhibit of the Orr family and the construction of the house. And it was finished just a year ago. And then, okay, on this wall, we have the family history of Emma and Nathaniel Orr. He came from Virginia, as I mentioned, in to Stillicum in 1852. Emma, his family came from Ireland originally and settled in Ontario. And then in 1866, she went all the way around the Horn from Ontario to Victoria to spend time with her sister and her brother-in-law. And we do have um, a list of the people who were on the ship that came up from San Francisco to Victoria and she is listed alone. And here she was about 16 years old. So that is an incredible time to be on your own. Anyway, so she came to Victoria. And as I mentioned, she and Nathaniel um, met each other and then they were subsequently married. And of course, here is the picture again, the wedding. And that was a traditional wedding picture with the man seated for some reason and the woman standing. Um, so it tells about how he transformed the wagon shop into a home for his bride. And then he built a wagon shop further down on the property. And so here are some of the children that were um, born to the family. This is a picture of Glenn Orr. He was the fourth son born and he was the last one. He was the last surviving son um, in 1974 at the age of 93 when he died. When we bought the house in July, Glenn and Bertha, it was the idea that they would live in the house as long as he survived. He died in December of 1974 and in March of 1975, the association took over the house. Emma was survived by only three children. So that was, um, Nathaniel was one of the sons, Glenn was a son, and a daughter, Mary Frances. Mary Frances did not marry. 
However, when Mary Frances died, Glenn went back to Virginia and he found a bride and brought Bertha back here and there was a 30 year difference in their age. So, but she fit in very well because he was rather a recluse and she would listen to all of his stories of the family. So when, the, when he died and Bertha went back to Virginia, I corresponded with her for probably over 20 years and I have 58 letters from her and this has given great insight into the family story. He built the wagon shop because he was an experienced wagon um, maker. And so we have conjecture as to what the house really, or the structure really looked like. So we feel it looked like this first one picture at the top with an open doors so that he could roll his new wagons newly completed out um, onto the street. And then we feel that because of Bertha too, because she, as I said, she had these wonderful stories to tell, that he had an outside stairway built so that he could have accommodations on the upper store story. So you have the stairs on the right, and then on the left, it probably was a lean-to, which is what this is now before it was turned into um, a real regular structure. And then you see the bottom one where you have the windows um, and then also when that had been enclosed and with a doorway. And these boards are some 16 inches wide. So obviously it's old growth um, fur that was used. So this kind of shows you what the construction was like. And this is part of our education too, is to say, okay, this is what it was, and now it's like this. But if we cover everything up, we will never know what it was. So when he had the wagon shop, he had a horse that was out back, the lathe was inside, and the horse would go round and round, and that's where you get your horsepower that we talk about today. One of the interesting things that Bertha had told me was that there were two holes in the dining room. Those two holes were where the belt went through to power the lathe. When something happened to the house, which I'll tell you about in a minute, Lo and behold, we found those two holes in the dining room. So it confirmed what she had said. And so an artist, Paul Clinton, um, did this black and white sketch. So when they were married, of course, it was turned into the house that we see today. And I think I didn't mention that the house was put on the National Register on its own merit in 1974 because it was a historic house special to Stillicum. It also had an orchard and on that orchard was a apple tree called the Sweet Summer Paradise which was very rare and there were only we think a couple um, still in existence. So that was one of the um, things that they decide, determined that this should be on the National Register. Now, okay, in eight, 1990, we realized that the Orr home had some problems. And you can see, this is what it looked like down in the basement. And in those days, there were no foundations. You had sometimes stones, and then your boards were put on top of those stones Sometimes it was just wood, which of course would rot away. So this is what had happened. It had seen its day. There were some posts that were upright, but some of those posts weren't attached to anything. So we needed to do something, and we had started to build a new foundation or to dig a new foundation. However, as it says, tragedy struck. And because the house was vertical, 
it had no horizontal support sufficient to hold it. So when it just went down like this, just like a, a deck of cards, and you can see this, and there was a tree, a pear tree on the corner, and we feel that probably that saved the house from going all the way down. So this is, this was a whole floor below here, and now the pant or the back porch is all the way to the ground, so you can see what's happened here. They had to move the house to one side so they could build the foundation. After that, it took a couple of years and we were very fortunate to get money. And also we received federal funds from um, Norm Dix with Save America's Treasures. And so between those two and all the donations from the town and the foundations in the area, we were able to um, restore this and also build the new museum next door. So when it moved back, we had been told that wood has a memory. And so even though it had been skewed, some of it seemed to go back in place. So that was a really interesting thing. So here is, they're moving this um, straight house or kind of a straight house back onto a new foundation. And then of course they had to square everything up. And so in the process, of course it had, it was structurally very firm now. It was not any longer single wall construction to a certain extent. So on the exterior walls, they had to put plywood because that would help to strengthen it besides these main beams that they had. And of course the chimney. So when we go back into the other room, I'll show you what a difference it makes on the exterior walls that are made of plywood. And then we have the regular vertical um, wood in most of the rooms too. So after we had done all of that, gotten this back, then the interior had to be done. Very fortunate to have the clothing that Emma and Nathaniel wore on their wedding. And so because of that, we were able to hire someone who would replicate Emma's dress because it, it was too valuable to of course put on a, a mannequin and have it out like this. So we had that wonderful wedding dress tucked away safely for, you know, to look at now and then. But this is a replica of her dress in, um, 1868 and then of course we did have his clothing so that was okay one of the fun things about this is we have put together a little folder and this shows what went under and so we have and this is for an education for the children and so we have two petticoats and then she has a crinoline corset and her pantaloons. So it was really quite a production when you got dressed in the morning. And we're very fortunate to have his outfit and also his top hat. As we go up the stairs, you can see these wonderful spindles, of course, again, which were done by um, Nathaniel's lathe. When the house fell, this whole stairway was um, compromised. And many, many of these spindles were cracked, broken, and so forth. And we were very fortunate to have a master craftsman who was a member come and say, do you need some help? And so he purchased a special lathe so he could replace the broken spindles, which was just wonderful. He was a retired cardiologist and here he had these wonderful skills as well. So as we go up the stairs, you will see that they have this faux painting that was on the cabinet in the kitchen. And again, we think that the sons probably did that. So 
We're going to go up the stairs, and then I'm going to talk about this wonderful wallpaper. This is a wonderful shot of this um, restored wallpaper that we have. As I mentioned, it was just a faded beige. We had no idea it was going to look like this. And it's this vivid gold, um, green and gold. And one of the things that was happening in the 1880s, gaslight had come to America. And so a lot of the wallpaper was gilded with either gold or silver which would be a reflection of the light. So this was very popular at that point. All right, I mentioned that when the house was restored in the late 1990s, that we had to have plywood put on the exterior walls to give it some strength. And because of that, we had to have someone come in who taped the seams of the plywood and then um, mudded it, as they said, so it would look like plaster. So these two outside walls are um, covered with this mud, and then the this particular wall has the vertical um, planks that we, all the rest of the house would have had originally. So this gives, an again, another education as to what can be done, and you'll notice the ceiling is also, of course, with the wood and the floor. The floor originally had red milk paint, and milk paint was very common in those days, and it held up very well. We did not use the milk paint when we replaced it, but it was that way. And in each of the cracks was newspaper, and this, again was to um, insulate, but we did take all of those off. This cradle was made by Nathaniel Orr for the Keach family who had a child in 1860. And then when Emma and Nathaniel started to have their children, Philip Keach gave it back to them. So we have a painting couch that was in the home. Actually, it was in the um, old woodshed and it was has been restored by Donna Quackenbush and then we have the bed over here that was um, one uh, who knows because with a large family and this was a large bedroom we have no idea maybe how many children slept here but probably three or four maybe so they may have had other beds in here as well but it is has an old quilt but it's not original to the family Okay, we have a Florence sewing machine here. The, in the San Francisco paper is an ad that advertising up and it says, if there is a Florence machine within 1,000 miles of San Francisco not working well, I will fix it without any expense to the owner. We don't know whether Emma took him up on that or not, but it is a very interesting machine. This is a yarn winder that Nathaniel made, and the commercial ones would have a mechanized object back here so that after you had done so many yarn twists of this, it would go pop, and then you would know the amount of yarn that you had um, put onto the winder. So pop goes the weasel. <laughs> this is the original color of the ceiling when we purchased the house. It's kind of like a whitewash to a certain extent, but of course it's a green wash, you might say. And um, it's interesting because you often have more questions than you have answers. And we're not quite sure. There's this piece along the ceiling would indicate that there maybe was a larger room behind that before he put the wall that he did. Um, or not. And then we have a hole in the ceiling and there could have been a stove pipe uh, that went up there from a stove. We know that he, when he had the wagon shop here, he had an outside stairway. He came up here and probably slept, probably took his meals at one of the 
restaurants downtown, but he probably stayed up here, but we're not sure exactly how this went. So again, more questions, but we do have the original um, ceiling and with its color and which has been retained into the second room. Here is the smallest bedroom in the house. We have put it together like a boy's bedroom, but um, we really don't know who slept in this room. This little desk here was made by one of the sons. Um, the beds were, we're not sure if they were handmade or not. The coverlet is one that is very popular, Dacard in the early 1800s. And this is the winter side, the dark side, and then this is the summer side. So in other words, you would reverse the quilt or the coverlet when the season, the appropriate season took place. And so you have two samples of this wonderful. The checkers were um, very popular. And these toys are not original, but it's just, as I say, kind of put together as a children's or a boy's room. This we have set up as a girl's room. Originally, I guess after Nathaniel died, Emma used this as her bedroom, according to one of the stories that we have heard. Um, this quilt is the oldest one that we have. It's not original to the house, but it is tiny one inch triangle. So it is a beautifully made quilt to be very appropriate on this bed. The little table in the corner was made by one of the sons. The story is that as the, when the sons got to a certain age, they went out to work with Nathaniel in the wagon shop and learn his trade. So there are stools and tables in the house and in the wagon shop that um, are, and wagon wheel actually too, um, that were actually crafted by the sons. Um, we have three lithographs here um, by Courier Knives. There is spring, summer, and fall. Unfortunately, we do not have the winter, but these were ones that were in the house too. And again, you can see these are the plastered walls, or I should say mudded walls over the plywood. And then these are the original vertical boards as well as the ceiling. Okay, we have a sample of what went under as far as these ladies of the 1880s. Lovely petticoats. Here's a long chemise. Here are split drawers. So is this one. So it, the laundry must have been very intensive when you had this type of undergarment besides all of the work clothes that you had when you were um, doing your daily chores, gardening, etc., etc. So anyway, these give a sample of what it would have been like.